Much, much, muchas gracias, Jorge. Realmente es un placer estar aquí. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I, Michael, how are you so in Spanish? I, I always, we, 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 we self in different committees and uh, we need to talk more in Spanish between ourselves. You know, but uh, it really is a pleasure to be here and the University of Puerto Rico is uh, really my home school. I, actually I worked for almost a year in the Department of Pharmacology also. That was in back 1981, then in 1980, 1980, that's a little bit, a, a long time ago. But uh, we, my wife and I uh, are very happy to be over there also. We, we have a lot of students from the University of Puerto Rico working in our different programs. Then we are talking about collaborative science and research integrity. And that's, that, that's a topic that is very, in tune with what's happening in science today, growing interconnections, relationship, relationships. Then what I, I'm just gonna talk about some principles and gonna also mention some of my experience on that. Uh, most of my research collaborations, uh, research has been critical. Uh, and then uh, we're gonna be talking about some elements. Then we have some learning objectives that we're gonna be dealing in this presentation. The first is why collaborative research or science has become the norm in modern science. Number two, important components of a successful research effort, collaborations. Understand research integrity, prominence in collaborative science understand that's important, important, and two more. Benefit of establishing an agreement before starting collaborations. And this is, I'm gonna be talking from even within one laboratory, but also labor, when you're writing grants, when you have these collaborations uh, diff, uh, between institutions, and sometimes we just fail on that and you got in a lot of trouble because we just, trust that everything is gonna be all right. And discuss key elements of collaborative science by discussing cases showing the dynamics interaction between collaborative science and research integrity. Then we're gonna have three cases, and what we're gonna be doing those three cases, we would like to divide the audience in three groups. And each group is gonna have one case and you're gonna choose a leader right away, and that leader is gonna then present those three cases so that we can have a good idea of how more interactions uh, on that. Okay, why collaborative science research? That's a question, why we do that? And what I would like to say, start saying is that that should be the rule or the norm instead of the exception in these days. Even at the level of the training of students, they benefit more when there are multiple people interacting with that student, a student to, to in, during the training. Then there are several reasons that are in the literature for instance, right now we know that high impact research projects are really complex. When you are studying cancer in general, if, you, if you're just focusing single methodologies or approaches, that is, that's gonna kill a project. Even if you are super expert in that, because Cancer, or in my case, I'm a neuroscientist, you know, some uh, injuries in the nervous system. Right there, they are complex problems, very complex situation. And, and then making, arranging teams to address a particular scientific question is a must in these days. Especially, especially, if you go to the point number two, if you want to have some funding for it. And that, obviously, universities cannot support research to the level that you need to accomplish. 
Then if you're going to get some funding, one of the things that the review panel is going to examine is what is the impact of this. And if you don't have very interesting approaches from that you deal with this from different perspectives and different corners, you're going to be disadvantaged. And then it is your responsibility, actually, to look for those interactions. It, you become a leader a, a, to answer that question. And yes, you are a scientist, but also you are like a coach and manager. You, you really, and that is critical. That's part of the reason that we need to start, and that's been happening nation, nationally now, to train students to be that, to be you know, leader. And they bring uh, expertise, to, expertise together. And technology right now is so, so uh, open that you can communicate with people in any part of the planet. Then that make it easier right now to make those collaborations. I can have my laboratory meetings here in Puerto Rico from my group in, in Loma Linda uh, just through my laptop. Then I don't have to be there really. And, and then uh, uh, even if I'm traveling, and, and I know Michael travels a lot, you know, he, he can have that going with his group at, at Davis, then that makes it easier for you to interact. Then that is what's happening, those, those elements. Three more, advances in different scientific fields made it impossible for you to be the person only in one area. You, 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 you can, right now, the, the, how society is moving along is that you have to have the mentality to, to bring the ideas together, to bring people together, to bring resources together to accomplish something. The monolithic approach in society is completely gone. It's not only biomedical science. It's in all aspects of society. See, even the, the Americans are, are collaborating with the Russians to, with the in space program. Uh, because it is part of the necessity. There's not too much money around. Then if, you're gonna, if, you, if you can save $20 billion if, because somebody else has that expertise, why do you want to bring Twenty billion dollars here, and make time, time to raise that kind of money when there is no exist. Then that is part of the the elements. Uh, another aspect of the collaboration is uh, in, right now there is an a, an, an emphasis that academic institutions that are doing research really m make some money from that research. Money come back. In, in the past, you have this institution like uh, Stanford, or, or you can see in Boston University, you can see other universities where that has been a tradition, having a tradition a, 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 in making money from, from uh, uh, the, the, the inventions. In, and you see uh, Stanford University, they get it, you know, a lot of millions of dollars every year. They have a system. And the, the law, the way it is written right now, the federal law, gives the universities those patent rights so that you can go and collaborate with industry and you retain your honor of the patent. And that can give you the op opportunity really to make those collaborations. And the last, the last part, the last element is that the incredible value, the incredible training value that it has, they establishing program like you know, the RISE program, for instance, from the perspective that the student is going to have multiple exposure to different area of research. That is so valuable that the review panels love that. They love that. And when they see a program that it is a very uh, uh, simple in approach, and the students, you know, doesn't have the rich richness of interactions. Then you get into trouble. Like you can make a case actually of that in an application. 
Of course, those are the reasons why you should do that, but when, when you start doing collaboration in science, if you are not careful, things can go really bad. And there are papers out there describing that, you know, how it can go. So it's internally, how happens in your own department or your own laboratory, your own institution. Because right now, you have arrow ones, even the arrow ones can be really, really, uh, can be put within a team work. And actually, it's, ex it's a encouraged to do, uh, do it that way. You have center grant, and I have been involved in certain grant as a director for, for more than 10 years. And I know the issues, all the egos involved, all the elements that you need to really deal with to have a center going. Because it's not easy, it's not easy. Then we have to do, we have to play this by the book when you are doing these uh, 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 collaborations. And, uh, and you have to learn from, from when you were a teenager playing baseball, for instance. I love baseball. And in baseball, it's a team sport. You know, you have a first base, second base, a shortstop, third base, a pitcher, catcher. Everybody is doing something. Outfielder. And maybe anybody know the rules. I, I, one of my best uh, time, I, free time that I was, well, free time, when I was, went to Loma Linda, they didn't have a baseball program in the city. And I, I, I started a little league. A Loma Linda Little League. And it was a lot of fun organizing the parents, organizing the kids, you know. But you know, and you know something that was very interesting. For the first time in my, my life, I played baseball my whole life, but I started reading about the rules of baseball. And you have this this book about all the regulation for Little League. And if you read it's very interesting. And those manuals and everything. And for me, so so easy when they had a question. Well, it's, this is what the manual said. This is the rules. I didn't invent this. And it was easy to run a program when you had all these regulations. The coaches, I did the training and everything. Well, you know, this is what it is. But when that doesn't happen, when nobody knows exactly, exactly what's going on, then you got in trouble. Then first compatible personalities. That really helps. There are people that you have very difficulties, or institutions, very difficulties that you can work with. That happens to everybody. Then, in the best scenario, you would like to collaborate with something that you have, you know, you can relate with, or an institution that you can relate with when you're doing partnership. However, that sometimes doesn't happen. Sometimes you have to collaborate because that's the only person that has that expertise that you need tomorrow, right away, with a person that is not, you know, that, that friendly. You do not really have the same connection. And sometimes you have to do it. You have to collaborate even with the enemies. Not, that's it. You have to sit down and collaborate because that's it. I remember I was in a place when I was learning my informatics, it uh, was a long time ago, by informatics. And this person didn't have people skills. Was a terrible person to deal with. Zero people skills. But, but if I'm not gonna mention your name, but it's the, it, but it's the person that really uh, was behind a lot of what we know today about, about informatics. Well, I just, you know, my ego, I became a, a very humble person dealing with that person. And I learned a lot of my, my bioinformatics for that person. But I, sometimes you have to do it. But that, when that happens, you have to work in you. And that requires a lot of really a strategy. Then, okay, you look to your person, be aware of personalities. You need to know that. You need to be a, a behavioral psychologist in training right there. And you need to be really clear what are the expectations of that collaboration, expectation. What clear objectives, no vague 
It will be well defined, well defined. Personal collaboration, institutional collaborations, intergroup, especially if you collaboration up in within your department, because you don't want misunderstanding. Everything has to be very clearly clearly defined. Cultural competence, oh, that is so critical. When you when you are establishing this uh, collaboration with other institutions that you have cultural uh, differences, uh, uh, I have, we have seen so many of those problems, even in those uh, you know uh, collaboration between institutions. You see, sometimes one-sided institutions or one-sided collaboration when one person is here and the other person is here because there's no mutual uh, understanding uh, of what it means, that collaboration. Communication. In a collaboration that is not a continuous collaboration arrangement, where you actually talk with a person, you talk to the person at least a weekly basis if you're distance, I, I, I guarantee you that there's going to be some problems. It's like a, when you're a parent and you don't talk to your teen at least you know, uh, every few days. It's, I know it's going to be a problem. And I remember when I was I had three kids. Well, they are adults now. But uh, I remember when, I, when there was a week there was not some collaboration, a, a communication, say, well, something's going to happen here. You have to communicate with your collaborator. Even if you don't know, don't know what to say, read some paper, ask some questions to initiate. You have to develop those and establish emails, uh, ask for questions, etc. And then you address those issues as they arise. Because then you have to have these long committees of two or one day because it's a big problem. If there is a data that's not consistent, if the other person is just laid back and you know and doesn't do things to the right time, if this if the other person really don't don't take you seriously and you know you have to finish your study, that you propose an age that collaboration and then you just you just have to keep going, and then you know uh, and then if the other person slow down, there are not timelines, you have to talk that out. The other institutions, you know, it's not providing those uh, recombinant proteins, are not providing, you know, the sequencing that was needed, it was then uh, the RAs, or whatever was not working, and they had to be done. But, and as uh, Michael was saying before that, authorship, if that is not arranged from the start, you start talking about that. That could be a huge, a huge problem. Because, you know, you, you, you want to hopefully have tenure, being promoted, and when you have tenure, you have some goals of maybe staying in the institution and moving forward, and you need to have some growth. And if you don't have this publication as a senior author, that could be a problem. That's the way it is. Because they know when you go to the review committee, then it goes, oh, there's how many publications as a senior author do you have? And they know you are just in the middle there, and then you have to be, you have to plan your career. You have to plan your career in that regards. And if you are a graduate student and, and, and then you are in the middle of everything, then t people are going to question when you go for postdocs, uh, but doctor, well, but what do you see your really first author publication? They, that has to be very clear from the start. No, no discussions. Then, well, then if we implement some of these rules, and there are others that they are common sense, but they has to be part of the game when you start. You don't start changing these while the game is is being played because that is a problem. Changing the rules while the game is being played. I remember I was I was uh, we were in a tournament with this city, and I had my team there, and and we were winning 11 to zero. And supposedly we had a rule that we agreed a few months ago in writing that. When if we were winning by 11 to zero by the fourth inning or the fifth inning, you know they they have to 
to uh, give up, and then we win the game. And then we were, uh, you know, you were gonna stay in the in the dugout, and then uh, uh, we was. I told the kids, you guys won. And all of a sudden, the rule was changed. No, we're gonna play the, the ninth inning. What? That was no part of the rule. You have to be clear because that can really in science and between people that have, you know, that those decisions can affect your career. That is, could be something dramatic. Okay, let's go about this ethics, you know, ethical principle that we have in, in collaborative science. Because in ethics, it's, it's, it's that norm that, that helps us to, to understand how to behave. You know, there are some, there are elements, and those, uh, I think we have one by ethics here. Uh, what, by ethics? Yeah, right here. At Loma Linda, we have a center for bioethics. Then if I have any serious question about, about ethics, I, I have a resource there. That's, bioethicists are really good people because uh, uh, they really know some of the rules that you sometimes are so busy, you are too busy doing research you don't understand. Okay, safe. You know, it, you can have a collab collaborative arrangement in this project, and safety is not a key element. Uh, and, and you can have serious, serious problems. I remember I was at Stanford, and I have one of the cases, uh, but this is not this case, just to, to, to for, for disclaimer. But there was this student, postdoctoral student, that he likes to work evenings, never work during the day in the laboratory. And we were just very curious and very, why this person never comes during the day? And you know, he worked, came, came after five o'clock and he was working the whole night. And there were a lot of reasons for that. But on one occasion, and we, you know, a very smart guy, and we, you know, collaborated and wanted to collaborate. He has some expertise that we didn't have. But one occasion, we came to the laboratory, and there was S35 everywhere at eight o'clock in the morning, everywhere. Now S35 and methylene, because it's very volatile, and he—that's why he works in, using 2DJ at that time. It's, you know. Of course, we changed the rules after that. Uh, no, no, we, you know, my my boss. But uh, but uh, sometimes safety has to be part. Oh, always have to be part of any collaboration. A critical part. Transparency. Oh, if you start hiding things from your collaborator. Oh, I got this exciting data, but we are not going to tell him. We are not going to tell him. We are going to tell her because, oh, that could be so a problem. Because we are so a small group in science that he or she is going to know. They, you need to have. You need to be able to establish this collaboration. That if you have a Nobel laureate, you know, discovery in the laboratory as part of that collaboration, you have to share that in that weekly communications is critical. That is an important element. Hiding data, no transparency, that could be devastating. Especially, you know, hiding data in the same department. Oh, wow, that is so difficult to do. We have to publish that somewhere. somewhere. And, you know, and then so what? Inclusion. Uh, community-based participatory research, and that's something that we do as part of the center. We have, when we do research with the community, they have to be part of that research from the start. No, go out there and tell them what to do. You know, this, this is it. You know, you take it or, or have it. That th this is what it is. No, <laughs> in, in, uh, that's something I learned actually. I learned uh, 12 years ago when I was 
And I learned it the hard way when I was establishing Loma Linda Little League that you don't go to the community and tell them what to do. Oh, this person comes from Loma Linda. It's very suspicious. You know, this scientist uh, think he's a baseball player. Uh, very suspicious. Then, then I learned, wow, we have to talk with the, with the community leaders. We have to talk with the council. We need to talk with the politician because they have to provide the, the parks. Then we really have to go, there's a two-way collaborations. That is critical. When we were establishing the high school program on Malinda, it's, it's, a, it's a program that we bring students from high school to actually do research in the laboratory, actually to really do research, no, no just uh, uh, you know, um, uh, go, being around, sitting down, have to do research. Uh, we have some concern you know, from the faculty, and now it's a great program. We're having a lot of students going through great outcomes. But I remember when I went to, went to talk with the principals and the school teachers, I didn't go over there to tell one, them what to do. I, I went to learn from them, how can we be helpful? How can we develop this to be a two-way street? But I learned that the hard way through, you know, a lot more in the Little League, to really communicate. The same thing happened, any research that you are doing in the community, especially people in public health, and, and even if people are not in public health, directly trained, like myself, that I have to train myself, uh, 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 you know, uh, as part of uh, my relationship with people that are experts in those areas. CBPR, inclusion is critical, inclusion and diversity. Education, disseminate. You have a responsibility to tell other people about your research. And that is not only the peer review in the publication, it's to the, to the community. Once you have this, this interaction with the community, you know, intervention diabetes, or intervention for whatever, uh, and then you have all this data, beautiful data, you have a responsibility to go back after everything the study is done and you, you talk about it. That is, is ethics. They own that. The same than you. You are the scientists. They were part of the process. They were collaborators uh, uh, and being, uh, you know, uh, part of the group. Respect. There has to be mutual respect, and and that is critical when you have a co a collaborations global, for instance, collaborations. When you have international research. Or when you have research from Puerto Rico and other institutions in the in the north that they they don't think where you're coming from, well, you, you have to be sure that that is there the respect mutual respect, and you don't have to have Puerto Rico in uh, institution in United States uh, uh, doing research or collaboration with uh, Native Americans, for instance. Or oh, you don't have too long. The only institution, one minority institution in one area and published area, then you have this huge university here and, and the same situation. You know, they are not respect, mutual respect. That is critical in the collaboration from the start. Social social justice and equity. That's that's becoming more uh, prevalent right now. See that when you're doing research just to benefit one group of the society, we are in trouble. And that's where health disparities, when, it, when health equity come into approach. You have to, to be sure that you're benefiting all the groups in your community, that this research include other. And even if you're doing a Western blood, you know, you, you have to think hard. You have to be having a big picture how you're doing these things. So sometimes I was trained just in a bench research. And I am, I know, I, I am a molecular neurobiologist, I'm a, a, a bench scientist, but, but uh, you have to now grow into see science from different perspectives as a student, as a faculty. And of course, you have this responsibility, this uh, accountability, everybody is responsible if you are part of the team. If you wrote a grant with NIH, for NIH in collaboration with another institution, or we have multiple PI, or we have a PI here, or we are a co-PI, 
when NIH is going to do a research or investigation about something happened, you are going to be part of that. Then you have the right to really be involved as a student, as a faculty, as a whatever. Then a key element is I am accountable. I am responsible. I feel that I'm responsible of this research. Then I need that. Now, if we have that, we need to have a clear agreement from the start. And sometimes we say, no, no, I, I, you know, I don't want to do that. You know, that could be problematic. And then we just we say a couple of things verbally, and then we no, well, that's when he got troubles. Especially if you submit the grants to an age with the, between two institutions that are not really at the same footing in terms of uh, infrastructure, and everything is very vague, in this day review panel can give you a lot of trouble. Because it is clear that, that, that the benefits can go only one way. This is a, an example. Uh, I probably can don't see it there, but I just wanted to put it there of an agreement. But NIH put it together there. But uh, this is the office of the Om Ombudsman, and what do you have first? What is the goal of the study? Second session: Who will do what? Wow, that's a very interesting question. Who will do what? And then you say, well, this person is going to be producing all the recombinant proteins. The other one is going to be the uh, NMR, uh, or the, uh, the other person is going to be all the imaging analysis. Uh, you know, very clear. Clear uh, responsibility. Credits. Authorship credit. Okay, who's going to be the senior author on, on this part of the project? Who's going to be, you know, uh, writing the paper? Uh, you have to, and if that is going to be changed, everybody has to agree. In that, you know, in that, in that, sometimes you have multiple institutions doing that. Then you have the contingencies and uh, other aspect, how to continue the research. Details. This is your next sample. It doesn't have to be that way. Okay. Questions? Yes? The one thing that sometimes comes up in academic industrial collaborations is in academia, we think when we discover something, we want to publish it. Where sometimes the industrial people still, when we discover something, we want to keep it a secret. And that can be a real problem with collaboration. That would be a real problem. And also, uh, you know, in the same collaboration between even the same department, you have a drug that it makes you something fantastic and the student wants to publish that paper. Then, you can, then the PI tell you, okay, what about if we do this and this? Uh, let's not publish that. Let's publish other things while we work it out.